good? Hmm. All right. Here we go. Okay, so my name is Adam. That's Alan. And ours was chapter four of the semantic data for like enterprises, big industries kind of. So basically chapter four, that's the book we were using. It was written by a professor. And you can the Amazon link to buy it. So outline. So basically, you know, why would you want to have semantic data? Is there, a, is there really a need to it? You know, you have all these databases of business that spend millions of dollars for. Is there a need to have it? We'll cover our contact and processing. You know, how should you go about setting these things up? How should we get the businesses to do those kinds of things? Make it better. Okay. Mm. Like left. Okay. Mm. Right, right here. Mm. Middle line. Okay. And then we'll talk about how. Like how. How can all this work together? You know, we have years of years of experience of doing it non-semantically. So how can we actually make it semantic? So we have the why. So semantic data deals with heterogeneity. I can never say that word. Heterogeneity. Cool. So basically, it's you have people write different files in different formats. So you have you have in some industries you have custom formats. Some businesses have their own proprietary format. How can you take all of that and make it you know together? Break it break it break it down. Make it semantically together from multiple formats. So it just doesn't work with one format versus multiple formats. What are the four different types of heterogeneity? But the four. You mean like XML, PDF, those kind of the file types? or No, that's just that's one of the types. There are four types of heterogeneity. Syntactic is one of them. And uh, uh, semantic, having different <laughs> meanings. <laughs> mm -hmm. Nice. And I'm not going to guess the other two. So the, the, at the lowest level it is system, physical transfer of data in bits and bytes. For example, uh, earlier days, there used to be a different format for representation of characters in IBM and uh, uh, others, EPSIDIC and ASCII. These are the two different forms of representation of the uh, you know, uh, and character, and coding. character coding. Yeah. And this is just one aspect of typically things, heterogeneous dealing with operating system as an example. Mm -hmm. So the file formats were, uh, files were not simply, or messages could not be understood by two different systems because they have different operating systems. The way they would store, chunk the messages and store on the sector and all that were different. Now that is harmonized to a almost full extent, except when you deal with uh, small devices versus computer, there is still a difference. So that is a system level heterogeneity. Uh, in the specific ways the data is stored on the system and that manipulated by operating system. It's tagged with metadata, the character encoding of the file. That is part, that is an example of the system level heterogeneity. Then the syntactical heterogeneity at the word at the level of you know words and characters and uh, you know you say worker uh, well um, uh, how do you represent the data whether it is a uh, table or whether it is a um, uh, a tree structure or whatever those are um, um, uh, what I mean here is. Um, So, not considering the structuring, so there is a, um, the use of uh, when a file relax comes in, and um, uh, people um, uh, use um, uh, strict interpretation of the characters or words as they are, then there is syntactic level. I'll come to the examples. There is a triangle that we will show you. Then uh, comes the um, uh, structural, whereby the information is uh, represented in different formats. Uh, formats in the sense, data structures is an example. So you have tree structure. You can take um, some data in XML and you can serialize it and store it a little differently. Right? Uh, so um, you can. Um, take uh, some HTML file and actually encode it, some aspects of it in XML. But the underlying information that is to be conveyed is the same, but there is structural or representation heterogeneity. And the semantic heterogeneity whereby you use the word worker synonymously with, uh, let's say, um, employee. Now, um, you're not worried about the fact that the uh, uh, the words are different, but that they have same meaning or different meaning. That's what we are worrying, worrying about. And so, syntactically, worker and employees are different. But semantically, they may be, depends upon the context, but they may be the same. Right? So, these are the four levels system.
syntax, structure, and semantics. Okay, you, wouldn't wrap, you wouldn't class that all under context aware? Oh, context is altogether different uh, yes, term. There is a lot of things that goes into context. Okay. I'll class one all over Yeah, we okay. pass on context right now. We are not ready to discuss that. Okay, all right. So, yeah. Okay, so semantics also deals with massive data sets. Basically, you know, enterprises have terabytes or not petabytes of data. Basically, they get now. I mean, it's not a good see what you get that in a day from like large scale businesses, especially with sensor data. If you have a sensor data, and you know, if we have our databases like Excel, stuff's so locked into our databases, and with so many data, our data is always changing now. It's always evolving. Everything's different. So being able to link things based on the fly is a lot better than us locked in database. So you have a big business, and you have like from a business standpoint, you have one business with multiple subsidiaries underneath it. The goal is basically to create an inter inter enterprise searchable database that you can use for financial services, government, healthcare. Um, basically, you know, group all that together to get one centralized location. But with the healthcare, especially, there's privacy privacy concerns about healthcare semantic data. You know, if you give too much information away, you can actually have privacy issues involved. So that's kind of a a sketchy area, but it's a good deal, but it's a little sketchy. On like basically giving away information that will lead to maybe identifying individuals. Yeah, it's actually uh, an entire research field on its own, is uh, dealing with privacy and access control in a, in a semantic way, I think. Um, maybe even be a couple students in, in our class who are looking into those things. And uh, semantic, semantic web technologies do play a role. Um, it's one option for uh, specifying which entities, or which uh, not entities in the semantic web sense. So, which organizations or which people have access to which data um, based on its based on its meaning and category? So, there's other, I mean, other problems. That's one big problem. The other problems are, you know, if your company and your contract is to do highly sensitive data, you don't want to be sharing that with like other groups of your business because multiple businesses have different sectors, right? So, if one sector is not not clear to set information, you don't want to share between the two. So, the biggest issue is like what you believe to be informational data that by itself is not classified, it may lead to classified data when it's put all together. So that's another part of semantic data that could be an issue when it comes to maybe the defense sector or the intelligence sector, or the government sector in general. Pieces in itself are not classified, but together they can build a system that is classified. So basically, there's issues with it. And as pointed out by Professor 1998, large amounts of data and information sources, that there's large visual data, there's large communication modes and bandwidth. And we need to optimize that. But now, in 2013, we have larger hard drives, massive memory, cloud computing shared drives. So those limitations and issues, they're maybe still in the background, but they're not really limited like they were back in 1998. So this pretty much is, we conquered that by having larger spaces. We now can store massive amounts of data in large repositories. So basically the problem with like storing all this data is not really a problem anymore. Actually, not really. Um, we surpass until nine until I believe two thousand eight. We had a capacity to store the data that is created in terms of raw ability for hard disk to store the data that is created by human uh, and on behalf of human by the machines. We had capacity to store that in two thousand eight or somewhere around that. We lost that capacity. The amount of data that the world generates now simply cannot be stored on all the hard drives and all the memories that we produce. So that is not totally true actually. The, the growth, the rate of growth of data actually has exceeded the rate of growth of our ability to save the data or store the data. But so what are you trying to keep though? You're trying to keep data, I guess it's limited to your... We are not able to. For example, Large amount of data that is created by, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, drones don't get processed. Or that uh, we, uh, large amount of data that um, uh, is generated by sensors, only you will only capture, uh, store the data if it is highly meaningful. As an example, let's say uh, every day there are uh, thousands upon thousands of sensors that generate all the data every second about with everything about weather none of, one does not store everything one processes the data computes certain things such as uh, average temperature high temperature low temperature 
hourly temperature, but one does not store data every every observation that a sensor has collected. We don't do that. So and in many cases, we have to aggregate the data, summarize it, and let the raw data go. So it's processed but not stored. Yeah, it may be processed. Stored. It may be, um, uh, a, a, you know, in part uh, when there is meaningful or important events occur, uh, processed but not always processed. Things of that nature. So nobody pays attention to something that's happening where there is no population, unless and uh, until there was some event that occurs that really so uh, you know uh, changes uh, and would impact human effect. Let's say uh, would impact on human. As an example. So, so no, not quite. You know, you know, the problem is not quite. But yes, problem is change. The other example is that um, uh, in earlier days, uh, in 19, uh, you know, before 2000, and some somewhere around there was, you know, more than a decade ago, the amount of video data generated was much smaller. Now, and communicated was very smaller. I remember that earlier um, we used to um, uh, send the video in QC format, quarter. Uh, you know, uh, size, you know, thing. So it won't take the entire, uh, you know, space on your terminal. Just a little, uh, you know, uh, two by two, uh, uh, only because that much data can be conveyed. And the videos will be jerky and um, uh, voice will be given prior to your video. And this kind of all the optimizations had to be done. A real player and all those things that were generated 10 years ago. Uh, uh, now you don't hear of real media and real networks and such, but that, you know that was a very major company competing with uh, uh, Microsoft, for example. Uh, now uh, all that is replaced by YouTube, for example, traffic or you know that's the biggest uh, video site. So and now on YouTube, uh, increasingly what you see is uh, the uh, high definition video, 720p, you know, video increasingly, right? So. Um, uh, our capacity to store large amount of video and transmit has substantially changed. Um, uh, now here the issue is that uh, the challenge uh, of, um, uh, well partly the challenge is less compared to those days in terms of how much of the video data can be uh, sent over the networks because most of, the, most of us have big pipes or such. And yet, um, uh, not always. You can't get always very good performance. Um, there are other challenges. Think about it. When you talk about um, large data sets on cloud computing, the issue is not about cloud computing and storage. There. The issue is about transmitting the data from one location at an enterprise onto the cloud. Because very large amount of data still takes hours and days to be transferred. So that's also an issue that remains. All right. Okay. So, sorry, where I was. Um, so now basically we're to a, a new point in our yes, computing evolutionary standpoint. So we have all these large data sets. We're now smarter. We know how to. We're getting better ways to calculate all the data together instead of just making one database, trying to make it smarter. So basically. We have new software now. There's new software on the rise that does this, helps us do it. So we're trying to make it better. And basically, again, it's to compile data from heterogeneous sources. So your structured, your semi, your non-structured, your XML feed, your tables, your Word documents, your media, just about any conceivable way to store data, we're going to try and siphon a usable semantic context out of it. And for businesses, it can be internal, external. doesn't really matter. For them, it might. Basically, then the goal is basically identify entities. So you want to basically say, okay, you know, these are people, these are places, these are things. And then also make it context aware. You know, if you have a sentence like, well, there's a big stars are playing at a concert in Anaheim. Computer doesn't know what that means. Stars can be in the skies. You can see stars that hit your head. You make it context aware. It can actually basically find the sentence context and find out what's happening there, if it's context aware. Looking at the, the word concert in it would help yeah. them realize that stars is referring to musicians. Yeah. That's looking at the context of the, the entity that's about it. Basically, diagramming sentences. If you guys ever diagram sentences in English, you're basically breaking it apart to find the context. So the goal is basically, you know, we need, we need to analyze and to correlate this data. Getting it all together is fine, but what do you want to do with it? How do you want to analyze it? So you know, locate relationships, the entities between the groups, among the groups. How are things react, related together? Basically, 
you know, can you find something that's not obvious? Was there something that previously wasn't known that now by connecting all of the dots together, you find to a new area, you find a new hypothesis based off of that? And then these guys, Zhang et al., they wrote a paper saying, okay, here's an alternate way to gleam it from unlabeled data. You know, can we take a data format that has no tags in it and siphon data from it? And fairly, not an old paper, but a fairly dated paper in technology terms, and they were able to prove it again. So we can do it. Yeah. We'll also show you guys a, a demo yeah. of, a, of a tool that was developed by Noesis to do exactly this type of thing. <clears throat> yeah, so the one, basically this is what the tool does, right, the bottom? Yeah. Like, yeah, it basically pulls through and pulls untagged data and basically makes a database out of it. Yeah, it finds the relationships between the concepts and by that it establishes links between documents that didn't previously exist. It was just plain unstructured text and through the entities that it mentions finds links to other documents that are um, talking either about the same thing or for a concept that's related to those contained by the first document. So these conceptual links is what it finds through um, I guess what could be considered latent semantic analysis. I guess well, that's at the end, right? Yeah, that's we'll show end. you guys yeah. that. We'll do it at the end because it might take some time to tear through. Yeah. The other goal was basically we need to enable automation for improved efficiencies. You can pay a million people to sit there and do this stuff, but if you can automate it, you can make it faster. I won't say more reliable, but a little bit more reliable than a human doing it over and over again. Trying to find the same reliable, repeatable data. I mean, you know, enabling fast traversal data. We have all this data. It, if it takes 10 years to get through a data set, it's worthless. Right, so there have been novel attempts to produce some results. So there's a program called, a paper called PEST, which is people actually wrote a program that was able to do like a, not a tree method, but a way to traverse semantic data fairly quickly. And it's a new paper actually just came out this last year, two years ago. So, so corporations are going to tell you, isn't Google, or isn't Excel enough? We have billions of databases. We spent billions of dollars making databases. Well, they already have them, so why would they want to upgrade? Why would they want to do semantic, right? But you can't, it's not easily searchable. It is searchable in database. You can make it searchable. It's not easily searchable in <coughs> semantic data. And, and corporations, a lot, of, a lot of companies have the same databases strung across different departments. So if you change one in one group, you got to send a memo to everybody, hey, change this one, right? As opposed to doing a cascade effect. Now there are ways around that, but sensitivity things, some people may not have access to all your information. And lacks of consistency. You, know, you tell somebody to do it, are they going to do it? You hope so. You don't know. And then, with having semantic data, you can find a way to consolidate your fragments of databases together. You know, so quit having them all across all these computers, have one place that basically cascades the effect down, consolidates all the data together. So, is it a waste of money to do all this? We already have our databases. We know they're solid, they're effective. You know, great, they were great. But what if you buy a company or you have a massive breakthrough in data? You know, you can't, merging those data sets is going to, or those databases will be not easy if you have it coded up to begin with. And most of these companies' databases probably started with, you know, older companies like LexisNexis, NCR, maybe the big ones. They started on the ground floor, so they've evolved as technology's gone. So their databases aren't like brand new. They've gone through multiple changes. So it'll be harder to get those to basically talk nicely to like a rival company that you've just acquired. So here comes our semantics. Clearly we have the need to do this. We need to kind of our groups together. Or for an enterprise, they have to do this. So the biggest thing is decision making is a group. You need to have a group. Like what are you going to call context? What is going to be important for you? What are you going to tag? What are you going to do this? I mean, it's not going to happen overnight. The group says it's going to take years. It, it still doesn't happen. Yeah. And it can be a, an iterative process. We mentioned the Excel spreadsheets. Uh, d across different departments, they may be managing duplicate copies of the same records. Um, and there's no way to do the transactions over those. So it's all decentralized, and there is really no synchronization between those. And uh, even because of slight variations in the, uh, the syntax, the syntactic structure of the field, um, those need to be normalized. And you know, semantics especially, even though like the entire integration process can't happen overnight, semantics will enable um, that data to at least be at least be uh, read to some degree um, in a fairly quick manner as opposed to like a full integration where you can do the reads and writes of it where it's fully normalized and understood across multiple databases. Uh, the semantics can help um, kind of parse and overcome those syntactic differences across the multiple databases and that can be done maybe almost overnight.
Almost. Almost. Come on. Over over a week, let's say. So basically with this method, there's three barriers to overcome. If you don't take control of managing it correctly, it's gonna be out of control. It'll just grow. You will you will lose control of your complexity of how big this could actually get if you start combining solid in your data sets. And again, diverse formats. You buy a company that does something in some proprietary format, now you gotta handle that. Same kind of thing we talked about earlier. And then, you know, how can you get intelligent information from your content? You put it all together, but what's it gonna tell you? Is it intelligent? Is it anything what you have before? So this is where the background knowledge comes in. Your context kind of not full context aware, but a little bit context aware to try and like glean information from what you're looking at. Try and make it a little smarter as opposed to just being words on paper. For an example, um, background knowledge can be used in the process of um, extracting this information from the unstructured text in the simple form of a dictionary, just a list of words, a list of the entities that it can recognize. Um, at that step, it can be you know, a simple dictionary mapping to a concept, just a string of text to a, con a concept. But then background knowledge also plays a critical role later on when you want to enable reasoning over that data and higher level queries so that you can ask more complex questions of your data background knowledge comes in there too. So it's at two different steps that, at least two different steps, that background knowledge is heavily relied upon. So, you know, will it ever work? Sounds great on paper. Will it work? There's already companies out there that sell some top bread, bread. Top bread is wonderful. Basically, they will help you integrate your enterprise data. And go get the link real quick. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just going to make the point and show uh, just literally on this one source, it's the, the W3C's site, um, submitted to the wiki. This product falls under a number of different categories here, but we can see that when we open one, there's there are a lot of different tools here, both commercial, like top grade, or open source, or free software that's used on in any, any given one of these categories is gonna have you know a, a list of them. So it shows that uh, this stuff is possible, and it's active in the industry. Back to the presentation. So, the question is, how do you put all this data together? It's kind of the same thing. We, this is our old friend metadata. Get ontologies, organize the main of the concepts. Scan the metadata, pull out the important parts, the contextual parts we need. Now, after you get all that information, it looks as normalized. This is a very, like, if you're going to basically destroy your database, your semantic database by doing it, this is a spot that's going to fall apart. Because if you don't normalize your data correctly, your whole, basically, semantic design could just be shattered. If you don't normalize it correctly, there's, I mean, it's like there's two parts in normalization step, and they both just play a part as you go down through it. So we'll, we'll touch on that a little later when we get to like the final flow of how you summarize it all together. But that'll just destroy it. You, you'll be useless after that. Yeah, it could end up in, you actually, you're trying to apply, yeah, you're applying to, or, you're attempting to extract semantics from this, but this, if, if it's normalized wrong, you can end up with even less information or even just flat out wrong information. So uh, it could end up setting you back a few steps rather than ahead. So normalization, you have to be very careful when you do that. So once you get all normalized, you basically you do a semantic searching. Works well, but you need to add a context awareness approach. You, can, you need to have a little bit more information about what's going on in the context of what you're looking for. And then your association, you just find the relevant relationships between people, places, adjectives, and all these things. So an example in the book was, now this is kind of a already done example. Like they've already ran through a, what, an analyzer, I guess you want to call it. Yeah, through an annotator. Okay. Um, so it's not so much like how you do it, but it's the same. Like you analyze documents looking for patterns. So in this case, they found pronouns, nouns, you know, businesses. Use the ontology to capture the specific knowledge. What is that? Let's get in. And then do the instant recognition. Yeah, named entity recognition. And those, um, that refers to the ones that show up as links here. Those are entities that exist in the background knowledge base. Uh, I don't know if you guys are able to read them, but um, say Hewlett Packard here is uh, referred to as a company. So in the, the, the ontology that's applied in this example, uh, that's I'm assuming as specific as this gets, but depending on whether it's a, depending on the specificity of the ontology, are you trying to apply it to just on a web scale or on a specific set of uh, targeted documents? 
um, depending on the specificity of the ontology, you could know a lot more about Hewlett Packard. In this case, we just uh, want to refer to that as a company. And um, maybe this shows the uh, association between some of them. It knows that all of these are companies, and presumably the ontology has some background knowledge about how these different companies are interrelated. Uh, I have a question. So I have a, uh, this has this uh, diagram, <coughs> of, you know, syntax structure semantics. Mm -hmm. Why did you guys not cover it? I think it's very important that every picture at least should be paid attention to and covered. And this one really gives examples so that I was trying to give you. Um, and if we had that, then the whole discussion would have been very concrete, right? About the system syntax uh, structure semantics. Yeah. I'm surprised that nobody in like the class pyramid. even spoke up. I didn't like that pyramid. You didn't like, but did you understand it? Yeah. But I just didn't like the way it, um, see, in my mind, this is a side note, right? But in my mind, it, it's all, the context of where is the biggest part of it. So you can have a system, you can have a semantic, you can have all that. But, like, all of that, in my mind, was context aware. So when I was looking at that pyramid, it wasn't, like, you know, system design like, from the bottom to the top. I, didn't, I just didn't like it. That was my personal opinion. I, I, didn't, I didn't like the pyramid. It just didn't go with what I was conceptually thinking at the time I was reading it. I think, um, so I would say that maybe there are probably gaps in, you know, uh, your full understanding of this oh, whole subject. Sure. Uh, because this, actually, pyramid has been very widely used by many people. Okay. It's not, you know, uh, uh, I, I think uh, that particular 2003 article is widely uh, used a, in the particular business circle and very clear way to say the transformations of the data or the different variety of metadata that you need to have. Do you, so it do you is, know a quick way for me to pull that up on here? Uh, you said it's been oh used yeah. by a lot of people. Can I get oh it to yeah. show the Google, ref or Google yeah. reference? You, you can easily pull it, pull it up. Just to give the title of... Uh, uh, you know, the paper is there, right? So you just give that title. Sheth 2003. What is the title of the paper? It's in the back of the bibliography. Hmm. Um, it just says what about, a caption? what about a caption for the, the pyramid? Uh, 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 well, Semantics for actionable information and business analytics. Alan? Yeah. If you open the uh, presentation which we gave on annotations, chapter three presentation, this pyramid is there in that presentation. Is it, is it the same one? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Okay. That's a, is it a private community? Yeah. Yeah, the Web 3.0? Our community, yeah. yeah. Right. You're part of it. Yeah, I was wondering if it was public or a private one. No, no, you're part of that community anyway, so if you sign on, then you go to Yeah, I can't, I can't sign in right now. I'll have to wait for a text message and all that stuff. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to Google it. I'm going to just Google it later. Yeah. Uh, I'll just do semantics uh, for enterprise data, shape, and Fisher. I'll do it. Okay. You want me to type
So yeah. uh, let's see. So at a very broad level, one would say that the data is structured, semi-structured, unstructured. That is just one of the many ways you can cut the pie, right? Um, the lowest level of metadata is syntactic metadata. And corresponding to that, uh, you could be dealing with uh, heterogeneity, or that is syntactic level heterogeneity. Um, so here, you can see, for example, document length is a metadata that says nothing about what is in the document, but it says what is the long length of the document, right? And that the day it was created, right? So these are all the data with regards to the syntactic property of a document. Metadata describing syntactic property of a document. Data uh, may have a structure. There is a document structure as in captured in DTDs in XML, XSL. There may be ways that you can structure the data based on some similarity, some algorithm, like clustering algorithm. And when you say, oh, I call this cluster something, <coughs> well, that became, the making of a cluster itself is a structural aspects of it. Things are related to each other in a certain way. They're close to each other in a certain way. It doesn't mean necessarily that they are meaning-wise same, although you would hope that they are. And that's why clustering is a technique that is used very often. And or other explicit way of representing the structure of the data, as in HTML, for example, even the tags, that is structural metadata. It says you where you can find what kind of information. That, uh, for example, if you take a news item and you look at the structure of the news item, in the case of um, news, uh, a very well known format that is used by people, uh, by the companies in that area worldwide is called news ML. It's an XML format adapted specifically for news. So metadata standard for news, XML based. So the data is primarily in XML except the new specific tags are introduced. So it will have uh, title, byline, who uh, owns originated story like ex Associated Press. It will have date. The date has a clear semantics. The date the story is filed. Not the date that event occurred that is reported here, right? It would have uh, a journalist name or, uh, you know, whosoever created, story created that name. So that specific set of tags are chosen with uh, the format in XML with the angular bracket, tag name, value. That will be the format. So it has a structure. And if some, uh, if both the applications uh, sending and receiving understand the structure, then different components of the documents and what they mean are become clear. So when a name of a person appears in the, uh, uh, associated with the tag of the uh, uh, writer of the story, then you know that is the story writer or journalist. As opposed to another name of the person that appears in the body of document that may be about some person being discussed or talked about in the story or news. Right? So there are two different persons. But because of the structure, and if there is a structure uh, indicates where that particular name appeared, you may know the context, that gives you the context, and that gives you the better meaning. Right? So there, the structure improves your semantic understanding. How do you know that in a document, uh, you know, you say the author equal to, and the, the, because it says author, it is also almost assumed that the author is a name of a person, although in some cases it can be organized or organization. Right? So, <coughs> what's it? Uh, yeah, I was going to say, wouldn't that be sy syntactic metadata? It kind of seems to fall under the category of the audio bitrate, encryption, affiliation. You'd have date last review. So, the moment that you have uh, uh, done, for example, uh, author equal to. 
and it is the XML structure, there's a T structure for crossing documents. So you're utilizing the structure to get to something else that is now in the document at some point of find you find going to find new DT, you know, based on DTD new tag. Then you're expecting structure and the tag you expect uh, the tag name is predefined. And hence there is a semantic associated with that. So it gives you, uh, you know, uh, the structure helps you understand what it is. Yeah, but that's that's also why I feel like this this structural metadata should be on the very bottom of the pyramid, even below the data itself. No, because um, uh, uh, some of the things uh, uh, may uh, not be um, uh, they, they are outside of the file itself. See, like the date last date uh, reviewed or last date modified or authorization. They are the outside of the document. These are still inside the document. Right? So this is all kind of enveloped, you know, it doesn't even say what the data is about. While here, you're going to find what the data is about. You're going to have title of a story as an example if it's news. Depends, again. Every again document will have different structure. If you say a JPEG file, it will have different structure. In fact, if you have a JPEG file, there will be a, an encoding of the file. And depending upon the authoring system you use, that may be already embedded in that. Right? So metadata may be put inside that thing, and there you are exploiting certain structure. Additionally, some of the software, for example, if you take PDF, or you take any word document, do you see there are properties there? Those properties are giving you a specific structure uh, because properties would have names. Uh, in, in, when you when you open the property, uh, you know part when you go to uh, you know from menu from a word, and then you say word uh, documents property, and then you will get a form, right? and you fill out the form. It will then one of the one of the thing would, there would be manager, another would be subject, right? Other place you can put copyright notice an example. So those are going to be uh, certain, you know, you know what to, when you, when it says that at a particular location you should expect certain type of information, you are ex exploiting structure. And the semantics is beyond that, is, is kind of explaining what it is. So suppose I were to see in the file, Sam Permisano, he was a CEO of IBM, he was the CEO of IBM when we created this uh, presentation. So we came across, you come across a name, then you recognize, oh, I know what that name is. Or I look up a knowledge base. And that knowledge base tells me that that is, uh, you know, uh, a, the CEO of that company. Now, this, without knowledge that this is a name of a person, and that this name of a person is, plays the role of CEO, for that company, all that is semantic aspect of what is called as a syntax. Sam, uh, suppose you look uh, write a string matching algorithm, and you kind of look for this particular string somewhere. Then your algorithm does not understand what <coughs> Sam Palmasino means. It's simply looking for that syntax. That is a syntax. When you are doing string matching, all you are doing is syntactic thing. But when you actually have understanding that that is name of a person, name of an organization, name of a location, that location is a, a city within a country, all these is semantics. Is it clear now? How is that not content? Don't worry. Or you just, so if you're going through semantic metadata, it's context, right? It's looking at the context in which that data is there. Right? So do you, do you just not call it context aware? Or okay, do you here, is, here is what I would do. I will give you some reading material on context because context is a very loaded word and we can discuss mm -hmm. that but it will take, uh, you know, your interpretation of context will be very different than interpretation of my interpretation of context. Context plays very useful role in associating semantics. I will, for example, say John Wood and uh, there is, uh, there are, let's say, 100 John Woods in the world, right? But um, when I know that um, that particular John Wood is talked about in the context of a particular art, and it is known that he has been a, there has been a known painter, let's say, 
for the sake of discussion, John Wood, a known painter. Then the context painting gave the context in which now John Wood became very meaningful to me and allowed me to distinguish between Jean, this John Wood against other John Woods. So that is where the context comes in, in a deeper form of semantics, in improving the semantic interpretation of itself. Understanding that this John Wood happens to be the artist is the semantic part. Using the context that here the John Woods used in the context of uh, 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 painting or art, and using that knowledge to interpret what this John, who jo which of the many John Wood this is, is the semantic, uh, you know, is the context you and that is using understanding semantics. Okay. Right? And there is a lot more than that, but uh, okay. uh, but but I think that is enough to get uh, uh, the use of our context uh, uh, at the level we are talking about here. So. I hope this is very clear. I want uh, um, uh, Vin. Can you explain me my uh, uh, explanation example of Sam Palmas? You know. Okay, come here and sit down, please, so you can see the screen. No, no. I, she, she, maybe if, that doesn't matter. She should. You know, the point here is why, why in the class if you can't see the screen. There's a, there's a space here, come. Well, that was, that was kind of our fault for not including this. Could have been more visible in our presentation, but sorry. But, but you, the point here is you are here to understand. So did you understand the sam what is the syntax aspects and what is the semantic aspects of Sam Parvacino? distinction that I want you to make. In fact, I can further give you a little bit more uh, uh, into just talking about Sam Parmasino uh, syntax, some aspect of what you might even call structure, a very um, tangential indirect aspect of structure and semantics. I'll explain the structure part very soon, but just give me what I said about when I would call Sam Parmasino is purely a syntactic issue. I, may, I think I've made a very clear distinction or explanation. So I, can mix, I can mix up the context. I, I have a problem with saying that the semantics is the context. So that's, that's where it's confusing me, the definitions are. Excuse me, because when it says up there, it's basically, San Puzo is nothing by itself. But when you have CEO of IBM, the context of that makes him, it's now the CEO of IBM. It's another context. So that means the same as the semantic. I'm just having the same plazo. Or whatever last name is. I don't think you understood the uh, context of painting that I gave. Yeah, like that is what. Uh, first of all, you cannot uh, use uh, your common sense notion of context and then talk about it. The, this discipline has, you know, the, so the, so. Um, uh, 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 Ramnath Guha wrote a uh, thesis on context in 1993 from Stanford. So there is a lot of material and people have defined it. Ultimately, people can communicate better only when there is a shared um, uh, view of it. So for you to understand the word appropriate use of word context, you should get the shared view and not insist on your common sensical view of the context and argue that context is same as semantics. Well, so okay, I was arguing, so that's just, okay, yeah, some of those papers are reading, because no. I've always looked at it as, common sensical view. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think I think it makes sense even in this pyramid. The way I would look at it is, um, <coughs> my point? Okay, uh, that context is just kind of a requirement in order to extract the semantic metadata. It's it's something that you use at this this tier of the pyramid to get the relationship. 
if I have a fact in a knowledge base, whereby the fact says, a triple says, Sam Palmin you know, is a CEO of IBM. And I know that my knowledge base, and I, I subscribe to the knowledge base. Right? And I come across, through name entity extraction name, called Sample Messina. I look up my knowledge base, and I know that now he's CEO of IBM. I don't need any other further dis discussion about context and such. I have the semantics. I have the meaning of Sample Messina. Well, unless your knowledge base has two different sample Masanos in it. Then, then there'll be they, the two different think can be... Um, well, that's where context comes into play. Right? Yes, but... Distinguishing those. So then, what you need to understand is the context in which this term was used in right. the document. Right. right. And it's at that tier. It's semantic meditation. Yes. Context would be always at that tier. Right. Yeah. Obviously. So context allows you to uh, disambiguate when there are multiple interpretations that are possible. That is one application of context. There is a lot of other use of context, for example, the context in which sensor is observing me. And, you know, so we can get to that. Right. Uh, professor, uh, here you said that semantic metadata is about company headquarters and taker, etc. So, SAM is the main topic of discussion or CEO of IBM is the main topic of discussion? Like you are more interested in knowing the CEO of IBM is who or Sam is I who? don't think that matters right now. In this particular example, we are simply saying that, okay, what I said was that if you have Sam Palmer, you know, that is in a document. The document has a lot of characters. Mm -hmm. And there happens to be the character string uh, whereby, um, you have a uh, you know uh, one word and another word, and that you look for. Or you don't understand anything other than the fact that there are two words with capitalizations, right? and that only thing you do is to do let's say character match, string match. At this point, you don't use any semantics. Your algorithm, your string match algorithm is doing purely a syntactic process. Is that clear? Are we clear? What is syntactic? Because it's here there is no understanding of what this thing means. Right? Now, um, there is a, a very limited form of uh, structure one can argue. Now, these are issues where there are not, people can, uh, people use a lot of different ways to say the same thing. But one form of structure uh, is uh, lexical rules and we know through our experiences and everybody in this room should know that in the names we capitalize first letter or the first name and the last name right if it is first name and last name they are same then you know in properly written text unless you are doing tweeting and other you know informal text but in the formal text or semi formal text you would be expecting to do um, uh, capitalization. So I might write a very simple rule um, which says that uh, find if there are two consecutive words and that the first letter of each of those words are capitalized, then that is probably a name of a person. Probably. Or is it proper noun? Yeah. Person, place, or thing. It's a proper noun, and depending upon, and then I can go further down, and if I use a parse of speech tagging, then I can probably say more about it also. But yes, San Antonio can be also can, would also qualify there, right? But let us say that my corpus deals with persons only, or let us say that I have a a database of all the possible human names. Of course, somebody may name a person also San Antonio. So these are always these problems, right? And that there are a number of actually names of uh, cities that can be person name also. So Houston is a part of you know it's called you know city name, but is a part of somebody's last name also. Houston. 
No, she brought up the uh, she brought up the topic of well the main topic of the article. Uh, do you consider that to be structural metadata? Because I see you have um, clustering and similarity processing concept so extraction. The same thing. It's like key phrase extraction. Would that be structural or semantic? So the same thing um, would have uh, a structural aspect, and then if you improve the interpretation, then your semantic aspect. And even at the semantic level, there'll be multiple level of semantic understanding. So Sam Parmesino happens to be a name of a person. Is semantic? So is Sam Parmesino is the name of a CEO of a company. That's also semantic. The letter has more semantics. The letter uh, has already a fact that CEO is always a person. So it is implicit as person when you say it's a CEO. So this is more semantics. So there are multiple levels of semantics that are possible, right? If I use, um, if my company had a particular document. So suppose you take a financial document that you have to file with um, um, uh, 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 SEC, uh, uh, SEC, uh, Security and Exchange Commission, and that there is a particular financial document where there is a very clear structure where you must name, name company's executive, <coughs> chief executive. Um, uh, if you file a uh, tax form for, a, for your small business, then the person signing it must be the chief executive or president of the company. And the second signature for the secretary. So it's now the form has a structure, right? So anything goes next to that is a chief executive or president of the company. That is known. Here you use the structure to tell you what is there. So when it, I found this value, the structure told me what the value is about. So the semantic interpretation, because now I know that, that what the, the thing that would be there would be the name of a person. But it is a structure that helped me find that. So that is the understanding I want you to have. Right? On the other hand, if I were to use natural language processing of some sort in the document, I did parsing, I did parse of speech tagging. From that, I derived the fact that this is a, a proper noun. And from that, I uh, you know, further uh, you know, uh, made uh, a judgment that this is uh, a, na a name of a person. Now, I, I did not you know, uh, uh, I was not given a strict syntax as in document syntax, and I use uh, a different set of things to understand that. Now, it's the process of saying what something means, if you would be able to, suppose I were to be able to use regular expression to tell you what would be there. This is an example of using the structural information, right? Is that? Really type expression. Because it's, it's a string matching. It's just thing. a string. Yeah. It's, it's not structured. You'd have to know. You mentioned like. A, right, no, I take it back. So it's just using a regular expression would be, um, uh, would be the string. But if I were to use, let's say, a document structure aspect saying that use a regular expression in addition to, uh, you know, go to the document, the body of the document. And then use regular expression. Then you first use syntactic uh, structure cue and applied syntactic uh, uh, technique after that. Right? Simple example is that in an XML document format, you have a structure, clear structure. And you have the tag that says what the thing is about, which helps you get the semantics. Traversal of the document would be a structural process, and anything that sol is solely derived using that property would be called structural metadata. Even though you could have used some syntactic approach to get it. 
So if you start with structural, you, you can use do like a regular expression, pull some out of the structural, you still call that structural metadata? <coughs> if you use, let's say, because you know the, this uh, XML is a tree, uh, you know, uh, base, uh, the, the, the fundamental data structure is tree, and you need the you know, traversal of the tree, uh, and uh, you picked out some part of the place to go to, then uh, that is a, you are you are using structural property, right, to get to that place. Even though then you would use like a regular expression or something to pull out a string, it would still be structural. But you can start a structural first to get to the body, and then typically, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So he uses both. Yeah. So he's used both. You just call it. Yeah. It's not. It's not just structured data. It's structural with something else to pull something else out of it. Okay. Well, what if the you know there's some case may be very simple where following that you whatever the value will be always in the code, so you just take it out. There's nothing mm -hmm. more to be done. You can of course say, oh, you might you, you are stripping the quote out also and call that as a syntactic operation, yeah. But um, right. so the meaning comes here. Just sample so by itself may be syntax, unless you start saying, oh, that is the name of a person, oh, that's the name of a CEO of a company, and you are getting more and more meaning of that. So I think the the point here is uh, so this distinction becomes very important. Uh, later on. Um, when you are going to discuss semantic search and when you uh, um, are essentially going to use things like um, uh, statistics uh, and or machine learning right? and then um, the system itself, the algorithm, the program did not really utilize semantics. That is why, say Google or Bing were not called semantic search engine because they did not use them. Now, when Google is starting to use, on in, in those aspects when Google is using, let's say explicitly, Google knowledge base, then people, uh, you see a number of articles that I have shared and others have shared, people call Google, uh, that aspect of Google, say Google is developing a semantic search engine. Right? So what is the distinction here? It's very clear, right? Before we started using this knowledge base that explicitly told you that this knowledge base has a, uh, you know, all the name of persons. You know, uh, these are all the persons. These are all the name of locations. So Google's no, Google's knowledge base has a uh, lot of well-known people there. Typically, those people who have Wikipedia pages, kind of thing. Not everybody in the world has Wikipedia pages, right? that uh, it has all these locations, particularly all the locations where people go and visit tourist places and so on and so forth. Also, let's say all those are there. And Google knows that this is a location. Google knows that this is a, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that Madrid is in Spain. That, that is a knowledge base, and that knowledge base is cement. Simply because, this, uh, you, know, you know, it's a location, you, can, you know, it's a tourist place, you know, that in this tourist space there is an opera house, all these different things that are there, you can make association with. And when that is used as part of search to better understand what human is looking for, or what is in the search result, then we have gotten semantic search. So in other way, the corollary of this is that if all you use this metadata, then you are not doing building a semantic search. If your search can give you file on a particular day, we are typically not calling, we typically don't call that semantic search. If you um, start asking the files that were authored by a particular person and the author information was pulled out by some syntactic means because there was inherent document structure, let's say, suppose I just take news ML document and as I told you, and you take it for granted from me that there is a particular tag that identifies who wrote the story. And that is called author, let's say. So, and, and that author was picked out because of a particular structure of the document. And then I might search supports you to be able to find documents by, written by this person. Then I have a search that has used syntactic proper, uh, structural properties of the document. And hence, I, I might call it, I would call it typically, a, 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 a search that utilize structural information or structural metadata. But one, when I go further 
up there and I have a, uh, you know, very under, good understanding that this particular author is with AP News, this particular author is with Reuters, this particular author is with Bloomberg. This person uh, is a columnist in, uh, in Wall Street Journal. This person, Nick, is uh, um, is the international, uh, you know, uh, 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 he always writes about and, you know, he's a uh, correspondence about international news for New York Times. And once I have that, I get a lot of, I, I have a lot of other ancillary information. Oh, if it's international news and it is written by Nick, I'm going to trust him because I, in the past, he's done a fantastic job and he has won a lot of awards. So the semantics, that meaning that I was able to get associated with the name Nick, Nick, uh, what is his last name? K, starts with K. Um, so uh, he's a very popular writer of uh, international stories and you know goes to Libya and all these things. So um, and you say, oh, anything written by this thing, I, you know, I understand. Oh, uh, Lou Dobbs, uh, he used to be CNN and now he's at Fox News and. Um, uh, we know now lose um, uh, political inclination, and now when I say the story is by Lou Dobbs, you would know his right wing inclination. You would know that he comes from this view on immigration. It's well known. His views on immigration is well known. He's always going to look from that color eyes, right? So. That would allow me to use semantics to understand, interpret all the things, right? These all things become possible when you go at this level. Until here you don't. And that, as I said, that's the most important thing I want you to understand here. Right? Yes, it is true that there's big variations here. Just I said, oh, this name of person versus that's a CEO of IBM. There is a distinction, big distinction. So there is this not, there can be different level of semantics. And the semantics can be very comprehensive. In the case of our uh, work on uh, social data, Twitteries, and last class I said that, uh, let me repeat it just so that you, uh, it reinforces that. La you know, in last class I talked talk to you about semantics might have spatial, temporal, thematic component, right? I give you all those examples. These can all be called, uh, or people contain network, or sentiment, or emotions, or intent. This can all be called, you know, aspects of meaning. So aspects of semantics. You don't talk about sentiment at the level of structure or syntax. You don't. Right. So I think we have plenty of. I hopefully, hopefully we have plenty of examples of what is semantics, right? And what is not semantics.
at this step while the data is on its way into the ontology, uh, normalized to fit the schema. If you do that wrong, you're just going to have inaccurate data in your, in your background knowledge that you've extracted. So if that's inaccurate, uh, basically it can be proven that uh, certain inferences that it can make or the reasoning that it does on top of uh, really any, any way that this schema, this ontology, is made use of. If the normalization is wrong on, with the data on its way in, then uh, it can just throw the whole thing off and become useless. Uh, also, with blending it all together, let's see that as data on its on its way out to being used in the application. Let's say you do further normalization on top of uh, what's done for the schema. Um, that's also going to throw throw things off much in the same way. Now, this is an example of an architecture for a semantic application. Uh, it's a little blurry, so apologize to you guys for that and. I won't walk through the whole flow of it. Just know the most important components, a knowledge base here, which uh, can correspond to your, your ontology, populated with the instance level data. You have a, uh, let's say, extractor toolkits down here, where you're actually, this is the thing where you're doing the natural language processing, the named entity recognition, um, also extract metadata here. You have a, uh, a world model which can help with providing the, the reasoning on that data which exists in your ontology once it's been extracted, metadata extracted. You're reasoning over it with your, uh, your world model. And this, let me see how much time I have left. Five minutes left? That sounds about right. You to break out? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So, I think I'll. I think I'll sit there while okay. I demo so I can click around. Schooner is uh, it's an application developed at Noesis, which is an example of uh, some of these steps along the way. Um, a lot of the components that were used for this exist in that, that architecture diagram that, that was shown. That wasn't the architecture for this application, but uh, there are a lot of parallels with it. And Basically, what this does is, we mentioned the latent semantic analysis earlier. It does some of that to establish these conceptual links between documents. Now, this is applied to biomedical literature, but uh, of, of unstructured text. It's basically looking at abstracts for, um, for uh, articles published in index by um, Medline. So, this is basically what the, our, our documents will look like. They're, they're abstracts to papers. See that it's, there is some structure. We have a title here, which is distinguished from the, the abstract, a URL. But as far as the actual content, the main content of it exists just in the body. And from here to here, it's unstructured information. Now, Schooner attempts to, um, it attempts to establish these links through semantic analysis. So initially, concept called VIP peptide was searched for and uh, let's see I'm gonna, I'm gonna okay. in the search results we see that it's done some named entity recognition which we talked about in there and uh, this is a bit like the like the snapshot of that text that had company names uh, within it um, it's doing exactly that these are the known entities that exist in the knowledge base here. So if we click on one, we see the associations with other entities. The, the triples are, are formatted in this way, and just in this tree structure. We see that the, these are all the relationships that uh, the VIP peptide plays a part of. So um, what we can do with this is look at all the things that it, this peptide inhibits all these, the hep G2, or it induces this. It increases something called uh, catecholamine biosynthesis. We can import this document into, into here to have the, in a type of a chain, you could open a, uh, another entity here called, let's see, catecholamines. And when I do that, I see that catecholamines themselves, they induce 
the beta adrogenic cell receptor. So that receptor, we could, we could click on that entity and find a link to yet another concept. And from there, we, the end result can be a hypothesis as follows. We see that this trail is built up of these relationships that were extracted. And um, just through this, uh, th through, this, through this chain of relations, we end up with a hypothesis that the VIP peptide affects fear conditioning. And um, yeah, and again, this uses some of the technologies that were in the architecture diagram of uh, SCORE or Symagic's Freedom. Um, Yeah, that one did not that that one did not uh, it did not include a, a world model. It didn't do any reasoning over that information because the whole goal of it was just to establish those links. But just the way that it was Schooner was applied to biomedical literature, the same can be done for enterprise data. Uh, documents are often stored just in I don't know some enterprise document management solutions and unstructured. For the most part, the body of the content may be unstructured. So using semantics. You can crawl through that, find entities that you recognize, uh, also extract relationships to other entities, and uh, browse them within a specific context. So, um, so did you explain anything? that thing uh, in detail? Score? Did you explain it in detail? Um, I think so. The main components of it. I think so. Did any of you have questions about it? So, uh, who can explain the top left corner, tax system? Who can explain that? I didn't go over that. Yeah, for time. So I think it's important to understand this thing. Uh, very core to the semantic thing will come on again. Let me explain that. In the, okay. Uh, even though we may have to come back later on next week. Right. That's okay. No, we actually we're actually finished. We're PR. Yeah, we're but just a side note, it's 4:50 now. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's fine. We have a lot of time. Uh, All right. Oh, no, this is five. five. So what time is it? It's 4.50. 4.50. 4.30. Oh. <laughs> All right, then um, we'll let you, I'm let you go and uh, uh, let me just get started, um, or at least try for, in, for five minutes. So fundamental aspect of uh, at least our semantic uh, technology uh, this happens to be, uh, you know, done by this company that I found in 1990 that I think I already mentioned to you. And there's a patent that was filed in 2000 and awarded in 2001. Uh, I used here the world board model, but that is nothing different from ontology. And in fact, the patent application does mention ontology. Uh, we use both the words because in those days, um, uh, the business people, because obviously we are in, you know, commercial, this is a, this is a commercial company, uh, we talk to people in, AOI, I've talked to people in, uh, uh, you know, document management companies or news syndication business and such. They would, for, they would not have heard what ontology, or if they would have heard what ontology, they would think of AI. And AI had a very bad name in those days. Um, it, uh, bad day names for because um, in the 80s AI promised the world, and it was not possible to deliver. Um, if you now uh, AI can claim that there have been number of successes, <coughs> uh, uh, rightly so. But anyway, we are talking about 12 years ago when that was much less. Of, uh, the most, uh, at least business did not think AI behind it. So we have to create the ontology or what is also called world model uh, here, um, and um, this ontology it was not an ontology; it was a set of ontologies for different domains. So the domains would be uh, business domain. B domains would be sports domain. Within the sports domain, it would be baseball, basketball, um, and, and any of the different you know, uh, games. In, and we even had a cricket there because number of them, uh, number of people in the company were from India, so they, they wanted to you know, follow cricket. But, um, um, and, um, and, and other things, uh, entertainment, uh, music, uh, movies, all those were there. Now what we did uh, was this first part. So there are three basic basic parts of it. And let me just maybe talk about only one part today and give you reading material uh, this evening and you should read more and then we come back and discuss more. 
So, um, we wanted to get all the knowledge, let's say, on uh, movies. Um, there used to be um, a site called, uh, so, so IMDB, for example, would have a lot of data. Uh, uh, there would be uh, Rotten Tomatoes, uh, kind of thing. Now, those, in those days, there were different sites. Uh, in the sites that were top sites now, one, there was one site called allmusic.com. I don't know if it exists now or not. Uh, but now there are a lot more companies that have music databases. Uh, in those days, uh, All Music uh, was a community driven <coughs> site where today the best data <coughs> on music comes uh, is on musicbrains.org. Right? Um, sometimes you have to go to <coughs> three, four, five different sites to get a variety of data necessary to uh, uh, get information. Now, for example, if it's baseball, we know that the top site and most uh, high quality data will probably come uh, to uh, will come from mlb.com major league major league baseball.com right so we have written what is called is knowledge extractor these were software agents that would crawl the website and understand the site structure and we were, we had a toolkit that will allow you to customize the crawler to go through the site structure and pay attention to which which of those pages have the info, you know, information we want. For example, um, we wanted information for every team. Now it will so happen that on this particular MLB.com, I, 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 you know, this the actual facts may actually vary. Uh, they would have typically one page per team, right? For every every team, they would have one page, and they would have a particular format table format. That means there is a structure. And uh, in structure would have, you know, uh, we know, you'd know, for example, uh, this is all the name of the team uh, members, and this is all the positions at which they play. play right? So we understood the structure, and our software engine would know how to traverse the structure. And then, at, once you reach a particular point, then you would use regular expression to pick up just the right information. But we know that this left side of this column would have name of a player, right side would have a position. Right? So we are using syntactic and structural information to map into semantic because here we would have an ontology, it would be a schema that would have a concept of team, team has player, player has a position, that would be a model as classes. Right? Just like today you can model all that in our, we model that it is the schematic level. Uh, our our representation was similar to RDFS kind of thing, All right? And our, uh, you know, in those days, RDF was not yet very popular. 1998 is when RDF actually uh, was became uh, I think standard, but it was not adopted at all. So uh, our our modeling uh, 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 level was similar to RDF. So we had name relation that was very fundamental to what we did. So when, when we, we would traverse and map all those things into this, one of the hardest things to do was disambiguation. When we find something here, and I know that's the name of a person, and I find something here, um, and by the same name, then what do I do? Then I would have to use, uh, of course, uh, it will be contextual. In that, of course, I can have two persons by the same name, but there will be different persons here if they are in different fields. But then there will be examples like Tiger Wood. In those days, Tiger Wood was a very big guy. Even today, he's a very important person. But um, you will find Tiger Wood uh, uh, in the context of naturally, you will find it in the context of golf. But you will also find him in business because he had a lot of deals with uh, you know uh, 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 advertisement deals and other things that he had. So clearly, from a business perspective, he was relevant. He was. A there his role would be spokesperson for a company. For example, he was a spokesperson for Accenture. Right? So he's, there you will come, different role. So how do I know? In some cases, there will be two different people playing two different roles by the same name. In, in this case, there will be one person playing two different roles. Right? So understanding this is hard. I will give you another very uh, uh, interesting example of those days. In uh, year 2000, uh, uh, for you 2000, so uh, November 6, 1999, there was an election. 
right? Or was it in a, a, on a, a 2000s, well, one of those two years, there's an election. And um, um, until then, uh, Hillary Clinton was um, uh, 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 the, the uh, um, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, first lady, right? First lady is actually a position, is a political position, right? So we had Hillary Clinton as first lady, but then our crawler went back to some site which gave us political data, and now we found Laura Bush. Was it Laura Bush or after Hillary Clinton was? I think Laura yes. Bush. Yes. Yeah. yeah, Barbara Bush was Laura Bush. So Laura Bush was uh, found. Now what do I do? Well, the fact is that Hillary Clinton was uh, first lady before this date, and now Laura Bush is first lady. So we had to. Uh, deprecate the in, 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 first fact, store it as past fact, and store the new fact. Now, see, this is very challenging. You think about it. So, dissemination is very hard. Uh, I will I will stop here because I know you have some other classes, and we will continue there. But I will ask you to do reading. I also got a perception just looking at today that not everybody has read the uh, book chapter. So, next class I will ask uh, questions to you to find out whether you read it or not. And I think this is serious uh, because I made the condition before you attended the class. Right? So, I expect that you will keep that condition. You must read the book chapters before you come here. And uh, I encourage the people who are going to present to put up the presentation a little bit earlier. That's not an absolute requirement. It would be nice to have that, but I think everybody should read that. I would also like uh, more conversations or engagement by the audiences next time, asking of more questions or not. If you don't ask questions, then I expect you to know all the answers. Okay? All right.